So good morning, everyone, and welcome at this dry efficiency online seminar on high temperature heat pumps in energy intensive industries and demonstration plants. I am Josefina Obesila. I'm head of EU Affairs at the European Heat Pump Association, and EHPA is one of the 14 partners involved in the dry efficiency project. The dry efficiency project aims to lead the European energy intensive industry to high energy efficiency and the reduction of fossil carbon emissions by means of waste heat recovery. And in the context of the current EU energy and climate policies, this is a very timely uh, debate and project and it has really a high added value. Because as you might know, the EU is increasing its 2030 target on greenhouse gas emissions to minus 55% by 2030. And in that context, it is revising a range of energy and climate legislations. And it has also published a number of communications and strategies. And one of the strategies is the EU strategy for energy system integration. And if we look at this document, it aims at a more integrated planning and operation of the energy system. So by linking the different yeah, pillars that currently exist, by linking in infrastructure consumption, the different en energy carriers, uh, renewables, energy efficiency, and so on. And um, one of the key aspects in the document is that the Commission wants a more circular energy system with energy efficiency as at its core. And there, the Commission explicitly mentions that one of the important ways to do this is by reusing waste heat from industrial processes, because they point out that 29% of industrial energy demand dissipates as waste heat, and this uh, yeah, can be reduced or reused. Um, they also refer in the, this context to the principle of circularity in line with the circular uh, economy action plan. So um, yeah, also as, as EHPA, we are actually advocating for renaming the concept of waste heat to circular energy, because we think it should be much more visible and much more known that heat pumps can do this reuse of, of waste heat. And then this heat is no longer wasted, but it's actually yeah, reused and it's circular energy. So that we, we think this should be stressed much more and therefore we are advocating for this. Um, if I go back to this document I was referring to, this energy system integration strategy, there the Commission also points out that there are, there are already certain provisions in, for example, the Energy Efficiency Directive, in the Renewable Energy Directive, that really want to target the potential of reusing uh, industrial waste heat, but that further strengthening is needed and uh, to lift certain barriers. And the Commission looks at four, says that there are, is currently four barriers that are hampering the wider application of these solutions. And that's first of all, that there's insufficient awareness and knowledge about these solutions. Then secondly, they say that there's reluctance of companies to enter into a new business that is not their core activity. Thirdly, there's a lack of regulatory and contractual frameworks to share the costs and benefits of the new investments. And then finally, they also say that barriers, there are also barriers related to planning transaction costs and pricing signals. So the, the dry efficiency project is really actively directly contributing to lifting these different barriers. And they do this by developing and then demonstrating two high temperature industrial heat pump systems uh, for waste heat recovery, and then by testing them in uh, European uh, industrial companies. So I would say, let's dive into it and go to uh, our speakers of today. So first of all, we will have two presentations on these uh, two high temperature industrial heat pump systems. And this will be followed then by three case studies uh, in which these are applied in uh, demonstration sites uh, at Scanship, Agrana and Wiener Berger. Uh, before we go to the first speaker, I would like to ask the audience if they have questions, please ask them in the Q&A section of, the, of Zoom and not in the chat. And then in the end, we will um, address these questions in the round table. Um, also, I want to mention that the session will be recorded and you will, all the participants or the regis registered uh, people will, re will receive a link uh, to the video of the conference. So um, I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Veronica Wilk, who will further introduce the dry efficiency product in more detail and also the first system, the closed loop system. 
Uh, Dr. Wilk, she's Senior Research Engineer and Thematic Coordinator at the Center for Energy at AIT, and she leads the research field Efficiency in Industrial Processes and Systems, and she works in national and international research projects. She is also the Scientific Coordinator of the Dry Efficiency Project. So, Veronica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, I will share my screen. I hope it works. I think this should, I think this should work now. Yeah, thank you very much. And also a warm welcome from my side. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many um, in this webinar today. It's already the second webinar of the project. And at the beginning, I want to give you a brief introduction of our project before we dive into the more um, technical contents. It's a Horizon 2020 project. Um, that we started in September 2016, and we are now in the fifth year, and um, the project is about to come to an end in August. And the goal of the project is to develop and demonstrate high temperature heat pumps um, in, energy, um, in energy intensive industry. And on this slide, um, you see the three demonstrators that have been built um, within the project and that are the topic of our webinar today. Um, I want to I also want you to uh, want to introduce you to the Dry Efficiency Consortium. So within the project, um, we developed two different heat pump systems. It's a closed loop heat pump system and an open loop heat pump system. And um, there are two RTOs um, represented in the consortium and they're each responsible for one of the systems. It's EIT for the closed loop and Synthes for the open loop. We have uh, three compressor manufacturers that contribute to that um, development. It's Pizza, Heaton and Rotrex. For the closed heat pump, we need um, a refrigerant that is supplied by Kimurs and a lubricant that has been developed by Fuchs. For the open loop heat pump, we also have a systems expert and plant engineer that is EPCON. And um, <clears throat> you're going to meet our three end users today, Agrana, Wiener Berger, and Scanship. Finally, we have two experts on uh, dissemination and exploitation, that's RTDS and EHPA, who is also hosting that webinar today. This is an illustration of the closed loop heat pump and the most important aspects that we, that we were working at in that project. Uh, so we, I want to start with the industrial waste heat source and I really like the framing that uh, Josephine introduced at the beginning. So this is our source for the so circular energy that we are using. Um, the waste heat has temperatures around 80 degrees C and it is used um, to evaporate the refrigerant. The refrigerant is compressed either in a screw compressor or a piston compressor. And this is also where we use the lubricant. The lubricant has to be sufficiently viscous for the operation of the compressors, and it also has to be compatible with uh, the refrigerant, optimum set. Um, so the, the scientific name is R1336MZZZ. It has been developed for high temperature application, and it's a low GWP refrigerant. And uh, to create a stable system with the lubricant at high temperatures, um, our partner Fuchs uh, spent a lot of development work in the project, and uh, that solution is now tested in the demonstrators. After the compression, uh, the refrigerant has high temperature and pressure, and it's condensed um, in the condenser to deliver the heat for the industrial drying processes. And here we aim to reach 160 degrees C, and uh, you will hear more about that in the presentations uh, by our demonstrators. And this is a more technical illustration of the um, refrigerant cycle of the closed loop heat pump. Um, at the beginning of the project, we have carried out um, a large number of uh, simulations to come up with a best suited uh, design for the heat pump cycle. And that's the twin cycle that is shown here. So we have two refrigerant cycles that are connected um, uh, by the water streams on the source and the sink side. And the condensers of the two cycles are connected in series and the evaporators can be either connected in series or in parallel. So here it is shown in parallel. And the benefit of the twin cycle system is that one of the refrigerant cycles that is shown here in yellow um, is operated at a lower condensing temperature. So we will get half of the heating capacity at a higher COP than the other half, which uh, contributes to the overall efficiency. In each cycle, we have a compressor module. The that either consists of a single screw compressor or four piston compressors. And within the refrigerant cycle, we also have an internal heat exchanger. Um, it's called IHX in this, um, in this diagram. 
And we need that internal heat exchanger to ensure that we have enough superheat for compression. This is due to the properties of the refrigerant, um, uh, the shape of the vapor dome basically, so that we need a, a large amount of superheat. And the internal heat exchanger is a way to provide the superheat in a very efficient manner. So we transfer the heat at the outlet of the condenser to the outlet of the evaporator. So we can get the superheat without lowering the evaporation temperature. So this is a very brief introduction to, um, to the inside of uh, the closed the peak pump. And with that, um, I will hand over to Michel. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you, Veronica. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. Sorry, I will just briefly intervene to introduce uh, Michael. Uh, so next is Michael Bentle. Um, he will explain the second system, namely the open loop system. And Dr. Michael Bentley, he's a senior researcher at Sintef Energy, and he's focusing on the development of high temperature heat pumps and their integration into the process industry. So Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, good morning. Um, as um, Josephine said, my name is uh, Michael Bantle. I'm um, working at, on time in Norway at Sintef. I think on the introduction slide, it was uh, said I work at IT in Austria. Um, not entirely true, but um, anyway. The, um, we have been working in this tri-efficiency project with the open loop heat pump, as we uh, to, uh, choose to name it. And um, basically, um, I want to outline today where we were developing this machine, this turbo compressor you see in the picture here, and how we integrated it in a steam dryer. <clears throat> a steam dryer, um, either direct or indirect, um, is what we basically require as a core process from, uh, for our integration of the open loop. From this uh, steam dryer, we get basically excess vapor in the form, um, yeah, that's basically the water we evaporate, evaporate from the product. Mm. And at the same time, also out of the dryer comes, apart from the dry product, a sort of either condensate or a cold steam which is um, no longer usable uh, in the drying process uh, simply because of the temperature level. And in a traditional system, this condensate or cold superheated steam is then reheated uh, either by oil, gas, or electricity in order to get again hot steam, which can be used as an energy supply for the steam dryer. So um, what we are doing uh, in the dry efficiency and have been done with doing in the dry efficiency that we um, took this very nice excess vapor, which was uh, almost 100% pure vapor at uh, one bar, and we compressed it up to a higher temperature and pressure level so that we can use this excess vapor now to reheat again the steam, uh, as illustrated here in a, in a basically a, a yeah, simple heat exchanger. Um, this is a principal concept, which uh, is an open loop, <clears throat> and it's called open loop because it's steam dryer is basically the evaporator and is open towards the compressor, while in the more closed loop heat pumps or conventional heat pumps, there's a heat exchanger in between, between the dryer and the, basically the working medium of the compressor. But here the dryer gives us the working medium directly. And this uh, working media, uh, working fluid for the heat pump is water. So I would like to outline a few advantages of using water or R780 in uh, heat pumps in general. It's a very abundant, and I think it's the most abundant element on the planet, very low cost. You get it everywhere, nearly unlimited available. And from an envir environmental point of view, water would be the ideal refrigerant above the zero degrees. It's non-toxic, non-flammable, zero ozone depletion potential, no global warming potential. So that basically also tells us there will be no regulative um, relief in the next, um, in, in, in the future that actually limits the use. And here I'm aiming a bit to the FGAS regulation for social work in, this, uh, in the heat pump sector. So basically water will be always available. That's at least my message here. And uh, it's also very efficient working through it, has a very high latent heat of evaporation. It's four to five times higher than that of hydrocarbons. So for example, CO2, which are also common refrigerants in this area here, uh, critical temperature, far beyond our uh, working area here, so that's good. And when we make a general comparison of the efficiency, the COP of heat pump systems using water compared to other working medias, we see we achieve always a bit of a higher COP, and that's because of the thermal properties. But no advantages without disadvantages. 
the uh, water basically requires uh, a very high volume flow. So we have, uh, at these pressure levels we are working here, we have a very high volume to transport and to compress. And that was the reason why we were choosing turbo compressors from Rotrex for this development here. We also see that water is in the compression very easy, we very easily superheat. So we have a very high super degree of superheating, which is not so beneficial for practical reasons. And here our partner Epcon was actually helping us also to build an de superheating system. So these are, I think, the general disadvantages which we have to deal in the project and this we have to deal anyway if we're using this working medium. Also, I said now we applied it on a superheated steam dryer, and that's a bit of a special kind of dryer, which is using actually steam as a working media instead of air. And um, the reason for that is uh, that steam is actually, uh, superheated steam, a better drying media from a thermodynamic point of view. It has a higher overall heat transfer coefficient, which gives us a faster drying rate. And it also has a higher viscosity, which means that uh, the final product quality, uh, product uh, moisture content can be much lower because the energy and the water the steam can penetrate and diffuse better inside the product and deliver also to the last pore the energy where the last product moisture content is then evaporated. There might be the other advantages and also disadvantages for using superheated steam as a drying medium, but if we would just put a, a working media, a drying medium, a drying medium, if we were to choose that today and we just compare these properties, we would most likely end up to using superheated steam and not air. But of course, I know that most dryers are basically based on air and that has traditional reason. And it's also um, one of the things we have to consider here and uh, where we then basically need the heat exchange between the air if we want to make our open loop close to. But anyway, just as a general uh, background, also why superheated steam is actually used here. And then some of the technical details. Um, if we are designing now our um, open loop heat pump, we have the choice to work with, uh, with the different uh, refrigeration uh, compressor stages. And of course, if we would just choose one compressor stage and the relatively low pressure increase, uh, one compressor would give us around two bar at the outlet for, that would mean we could reheat up to 120 degrees. Then we would basically need a very large dryer system, which can operate a very low delta T. Um, on the other hand, we have, of course, three or multi-stage compression system, which can lift uh, to higher pressure levels, where we can recondensate here seven between seven and eight bar, which would give us almost 170 degrees um, uh, temperature, but the efficiency would go down. So one of the main working we were doing here was to find the sweet spot between the right dryer size and efficient heat pump system and how many compression stages we are needing. And we were ending up that we have a two stage um, turbo compressor stages with intercooling in between, which will lift uh, to about uh, a pressure to about four point something. Uh, so it means that we can reheat our um, superheated steam to up to 140, 145 degrees from 100. So we have the dryer will operate with a delta T of around uh, 45 and uh, yeah, this is uh, basically all uh, simulations. And um, later on, uh, my colleague uh, Opor from Scanship will tell you how this was um, then realized in real life and where the practical uh, challenges are. Thank you, and back to you, Josephine. Thank you very much, Michael. So as you already uh, indicated, so next up are the different demonstration sites where these two systems uh, are tested. And first of all, we have uh, Paul Jaren Nielsen, who will explain the scholarship demonstration site. Uh, Paul owns a PhD in fluid mechanics, and he has 20 years of experience in process and product development in oil and gas, as well as 12, as well as 12 years of experience uh, in process and product development in bioenergy, biogas, and waste management. So he will talk about the Scanship demonstration site, and Scanship is a company based in Norway that produces advanced wastewater purification and waste management systems for ferries, cruise ships, uh, disaster relief, and merchant shipping. So, uh, and he will show you how this open loop uh, was um, yeah, applied at ScanShip. So, um, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Thank you. Um, 
Ganship is happy to join RIF. Uh, we came in a bit late in the project, but nevertheless, we were able to um, uh, be allowed to, to demonstrate the open loop uh, heat pump system. Scanship is a company from uh, Norway uh, dealing with uh, wastewater waste management on cruise ships in particular, but also have an extensive activity on land-based industries, aquaculture, and, uh, and so on. So uh, we were intrigued by this uh, open loop uh, steam uh, driven uh, heat exchange, uh, heat pump system, uh, since we already had uh, a lot of dryers. Uh, we have own design, build and sell to, uh, to the cruise ships. And we saw a, a huge benefit of, of these energy uh, savings. Uh, regarding the demonstration site, we have been located in uh, Lindum, is outside uh, outside Oslo. Uh, it's only 20 minutes drive from our uh, innovation lab where I'm working, so um, so it's very beneficial. Lindum is a very forward-leaning waste management company in in Norway, uh, operating biogas plants, a lot of uh, compost facilities. They do garden waste, demolition wood, uh, and sewage sludge, food waste, digesters, and so on and so forth. So, so we have, uh, for our purposes, a unique site where we could explore a huge variety of biomass uh, for drying uh, and um, for um, for our purpose in particular to to dry biomass uh, as <clears throat> required for for the pyrolysis of the biomass to produce biochar and and syngas for uh, energy exploration so in order to do uh, pyrolysis we need the dry biomass uh, less than 15 10 10 to 15 percent moisture so um, so, so that's why uh, we were especially interested in these uh, systems. And we are talking about uh, anything from uh, sewage sludge coming in at 80% uh, moisture to uh, demolition wood uh, coming in at 60-70% uh, moisture, uh, sorry, 30% moisture. So it's a huge variety of feedstocks um, that could be processed and develop uh, uh, premium biochar that we would use for uh, a lot of purposes. So uh, how did we do this? Our traditional dryers for cruise ships uh, handling uh, sewage sludge and food waste in particular uh, were a paddle batch dryers, paddle type with a heating jacket and um, on ships, we use uh, excess steam. Uh, in land-based uh, aquaculture systems, we use uh, electrical oil heaters uh, to take very wet sludge into the machine for a batch, circulate uh, air, condense the water, uh, and also have some control of others. Uh, typically, we use 800 kilowatt hours worth of, uh, of uh, energy to evaporate a ton of water in these systems. It's uh, important for us to do batch because we could also then take some uh, biomasses that requires hygienization and we could control time and temperature in these processes to get uh, hygienized uh, dried products that could be beneficially used for soil improvement or, or other applications. And that's also an important point for us when we come to try to redesign this uh, system for uh, for um, for the superheated uh, uh, heat pump systems. So what we have done uh, here, we have made now an indirect and a di direct uh, heat uh, dryer in the sense that we take the evaporated uh, water from the biomass into the compressors and, and put it back again uh, to recover the, the heat of condensation. Uh, and we put that to a heat exchanger in the circulation loop of steam. And we also put it in the heating jacket of the dryer. So it's uh, a combined effort. Uh, and that has also shown to improve the efficiency and the capacity of the dryer 
uh, with um, with almost 100 percent which is uh, very good so we are very happy with this uh, so it was a heavy design work and, and manufacturing work to provide the new dryers that really could utilize these superheated steam for the drying purposes. Uh, one of the challenge is of course to have a continuous heat pump system running on the batch, uh, batch dryers. So we put two dryers in parallel uh, to, to multiplex them and make um, the system uh, smoother. Uh, one challenge in having these huge vari variations in feedstock is that we have all sort of uh, rheological properties with uh, sticky sludge to very dry, dusty compost. Uh, and one of the parasitic uh, uh, activities in a superheated um, steam dryer with heat pumps is of course that you need to really circulate the the steam uh, around the dryer. Uh, in our case, we are able to get 150 degrees out of the compressor. To be safe, we need more than 100 degrees to be able to have superheated steam uh, going out. So for all practical purposes, we go out with 110. That is 40 degrees uh, temperature difference picked up in this circulation. And then the simple thermodynamic uh, <coughs> basics gives you that this fan needs to operate at a flow rate 30 times the, the rate that is actually evaporated. So we have to circulate a lot of steam to get out the water from the biomass as steam to the compressors. So this has been working well. We have designed uh, a heat exchanger specially purpose for this. Uh, and we are now uh, optimizing it in terms of handling, uh, in particular, uh, dust when we are doing challenging uh, materials. But uh, so far, uh, so good. Uh, so that was the theory. And, and this is sort of the, the, the physical uh, hardware. For, for ease uh, of implementation, we took uh, the entire test rig that Synthef had used in, uh, in the uh, initial development of the heat pump uh, with the intercooler uh, and, uh, and so on, um, down to our facility. So, so, so that, that, that holds the, this um, system in the back here. For future industrial application, we will uh, downsize this and, and make this more compact. Uh, um, but that has nothing to say for the testing. You can see uh, the dryers. Uh, we have a hopper for feed of uh, any sort of, uh, of biomass. Uh, and uh, then we have the output coming out here. So the dry biomass could go either in big bags or it could even go directly to a pelletizer to produce uh, dry pelletized uh, uh, biomass. So uh, this is a picture of sort of uh, the main elements of this uh, superheated um, steam dryer. You can see uh, our dryer, uh, a guy on top is doing some modifications. Uh, on the right, you have the heat exchanger we have developed with easy access, so we can go in and, and, and wash it out if it is accumulating of dust in this case. Uh, and then you have the fan running with uh, large pipes to circulate the, the steam. So um, all in all, we are happy. We need still to do some, uh, some optimization. And the last part for us would be to do uh, some uh, long-term uh, uh, runs to, to get the operating hours sufficient to, to, to get uh, ticked off the reliability of all the equipment. So far, we have dried some 100 tons of biomass uh, to the, for the, our clients, and they are happy with the product so far. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so now we will look at the next demo demonstration site who will be, that will be explained to us by uh, Thomas uh, Laminger. 
Um, Dr. Thomas Laminger, he studied chemical engineering and he has a PhD in the field of mechanical process engineering. And since February 2020, he has been working as assistant pro production manager at Agrana Pischelsdorf. And at the end of May 2020, he took over uh, the management of the dry efficiency project at Agrana. So Agrana is a leading Austrian company, um, adding value to agricultural commodities by producing a wide range of industrial pro products for the processing sector. So it operates many dryers in its 54 sugar and starch uh, factories. Um, and there the closed loop uh, system was uh, applied. So please, uh, Mr. Laminger, the floor is yours. Thank you for a kind introduction. So uh, my presentation, uh, will concentrate on the implementation of uh, the demonstrator in our wheat starch plant uh, VSR1. You can see here uh, on my screen a picture of Pischlsdorf, which is located about 50 kilometers west of uh, Vienna. Uh, and next to the Danube, uh, started 2007 uh, with the bioethanol plant. And then later in 2013 and 2020, uh, uh, two restart plan processing plans were added uh, on the side. So as uh, already heard, we are producing a lot of materials here in Pischlstorf, of course, bioethanol, CO2, restart and wheat protein, protein and as well some uh, food um, materials. So the, uh, in, Previous studies, uh, one of our dryer, the starch dryer, was identified as a, a location for uh, the implementation of the demo uh, heat pump device. And you can see here on the picture the container outside uh, the starch, starch dryer, uh, VSR1. Uh, the in installation started already at the end of uh, the, uh, September 2019. The commissioning then in May 2020, last year, and uh, yeah, test trial or still ongoing performance uh, is uh, what we're doing right now. The design parameters uh, of this heat pump uh, was about uh, having a heating capacity of 400 kilowatts, which is approximately 10% of the overall uh, start dryer heat demand. And yeah, we were expecting to have 110, 160 degrees Celsius as a heat supply in the temperature, COP up to four. I will later show you some results. And uh, I will tell you a little bit more about the integration in a few slides later. So this picture we have already seen, we are here in Bischelstorf, we have the uh, twin cycle um, uh, closed loop system we have in two screw compressors uh, by Pitzer. Everything is within this uh, 20 feet uh, container outside. Um, yeah. Then I will go further on to the implementation. The closed loop itself is completely inside the container as well as the control system. And uh, as I already said, outside of the wheat starch factory uh, next to the flow dryer, uh, we're integrated uh, the the, um, into our um, drying uh, of the air system. Uh, the wheat starch factory is connected with flow dryer by having a huge uh, demand of air to be heated up, starting with our, our water exchange, uh, which is um, uh, loaded by our, our heat recovery cycle. You can see here we're approximately 90 to 70 degrees uh, drop here. Uh, then followed by um, um, steam exchanger, uh, steam uh, air exchanger. We have here then our exhaust air having about 150, 160 degrees Celsius, where our wet product uh, containing 35% moisture, the wet starch, then becomes dried uh, to a dry product of approximately 12% moisture content. And the overall capacity is uh, something around 14 tons per hour of the dryer. So the integration uh, was done like this. You can see now we have uh, filled the gap here between these two existing uh, heat exchangers by a third one, 
where uh, the intermediate circuit, uh, it's a water cycle uh, coming from the condenser side, going up to 140, 160 degrees Celsius, which gives us uh, a little bit lower steam demand uh, on the dry itself. The uh, sourcing uh, was um, connected to our uh, water or heat recovery cycle. So we have here around this 70, 75 uh, degrees Celsius uh, going to the evaporator and leaving here with approximately 60 degrees Celsius. What we have achieved since last year, you can see on this slide, we have already something around 2,300 hours of operation. You can see here on the top in red, uh, a distribution of the hours uh, uh, and different uh, temperatures of our sink. We, you can see we are mostly operating in the window of around 130, 140 degrees Celsius, but we already have achieved a couple of hours already close to 160 degrees Celsius. It was a maximum of 157 uh, a couple of days ago. So this is where we are uh, uh, still working on to getting more hours here on this uh, high, very high temperature output. And I've put here a couple of um, uh, different operation uh, points so where you can see here on the left-hand side, the heat output and the electricity demand. And on the right-hand side, uh, right side, the COP values, which of course depends a lot on the temperature lift. Uh, we're having here from around 45 to 80, uh, Kelvins and the COP of course is varying between what was expected from four to going down 2.2. What we are uh, in our complex um, uh, heat recovery cycle system, uh, we have varying, uh, very fluctuating source temperature. You can see on this dot, we have here different temperatures uh, at the, the source outlet from 67 going down to only 58. So this is why the dots are a little bit spread around. When we take a look uh, on the performance side, comparing uh, what we can save, we have here uh, on this slide, uh, the CO2 savings calculated uh, for approximately 8,300 hours per year uh, with an Austrian mix. So we can see we are uh, quite in the range of what was expected uh, to have something around up to 600 tons per year of CO2 savings, uh, which can be achieved, which is uh, quite nice compared to what we have seen so far. And uh, what we will do in the next uh, following uh, months, which is left on the project, we still have a lot of things to do to, uh, to split in two thirds uh, to get more uh, operation hours on the high temperature side, going back to different operation points, points uh, close to design point. And of course, to see where are the operational limits of the heat pump itself to be at a more challenging uh, sites and operations. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Finally, we go to the third demonstration site at uh, Wienerberger that will be presented by Mr. Stefan Puskas. Um, Mr. Puskas uh, is a project manager engineering technical support at Wienerberger Building Solutions. And since 2008, he's active in the R&D at Wienerberger. So, and his focus is on energy efficiency in the production of heavy clay uh, ceramics. And he's also in charge um, with the development um, sorry. With sorry. The of drying and <laughs> firing <laughs> simulation tools, uh, burner development and heat recovery systems related to heat pumps. Um, about the company Wienerberger. Wienerberger is the world's largest producer of bricks and number one in the clay roof tiles market in Europe. And the company operates approximately 200 brick dryers in its manufacturing units worldwide. So Mr. Puskas, the, word, the floor is yours. Perfect introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, 
you have mentioned Wienerberger is a big company. We uh, employed last year 16,000 uh, people producing mainly clay blocks, roof tiles, and facing bricks. Uh, we focus, like I mentioned before, on the closed loop system, and we are one of the two demonstrators, and we integrated this high temperature heat pump into our brick manufacturing process. This is not comparable to the facility of Agrana. It's much, much smaller. We are on the countryside in Utendorf. It's a village in Upper Austria where this uh, production facility is situated. It produces 280 tons of clay blocks per day and is medium size in compared to other production size. Uh, sites. What do we do in a brick production? We have to shape clay, we have to dry the clay to prepare to be ready to go through the kiln where the product gets fired. And then we have the uh, final product. The most energy intensive process is here the dryer. We see that the tunnel kiln is uh, nothing else like a, a, a counterflow heat exchanger. The product gets heated up to close to 1000 degrees Celsius. And in the cooling zone, we have to get rid of this energy. Uh, for sure, this energy could be needed in the heating zone of the kiln, but it is not possible up to now to take all, to pick all this energy available to the heating zone. So what do we do? Or what was done in the, in the past? We take this energy and uh, operate the tunnel dryer. And uh, now it is so that we steal, it's not taking excess temperature, excess heat, but we steal the energy from the kiln to operate the dryer. And what happens is that all the sensible heat here stored in the bricks comes out in form of moist air through the chimneys. Um, yeah, this looks like this in winter. You see a small uh, uh, vapor uh, 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 flow from the chimney of the kiln and a big vapor flow from the dryer. When we look on the energy flow very simplified of a average brick production. We operated with natural gas and of this natural gas, 30%, less than 30% of the uh, energy uh, comes out of the flue gas chimney that is connected to the kiln. And the major part by far more than a, a third part of the uh, energy supply comes out of moist, in form of moist air from the dryer with a bunch of losses and a very small part remains in the product. So we have to focus on this energy source. Our losses are by far higher than mentioned in the, in the introduction, uh, what is average in the industry in Europe. So we have this situation you've seen before, the, the kiln and the dryer and the losses through the ex exhaust air chimney from the dryer. Now we want to pick this energy and we, um, uh, we have decided to do it in, in a two-stage process. And we these projects are called demo plant and dry efficiency. In the first stage, we installed a single-stage lithium bromide absorption heat pump that is driven with excess heat from the kiln and is doing uh, is providing cold water that is sprayed into the cooling tower and the scrubber where the moist air from the dryer uh, goes through and we gain warm water of about 40 degrees Celsius. The absorption heat pump lifts this temperature to 90 degrees. And with this water, we go into the dryer. Oh, you do not see my pointer. Yeah. Ah, there is a pointer here. So we have here the wet air scrubber. We have an absorption heat pump driven by excess heat from the, from the kiln. We provide, it provides 90 degrees of water and uh, internal heat exchangers in the dryer uh, are used to operate the dryer. But since this dryer building is limited in space, it's a decades old building, uh, and it's not possible to uh, reach the, the residual moisture needed to be ready for the kiln, we need a high temperature. And this is where comes dry efficiency into, uh, into, into this uh, project. Uh, dry efficiency picks a quite small part of the energy of the 90 degrees water circuit and lifts uh, and provides temperatures of up to 160 degrees. When you have a bird view on the dryer in Utendorf, this is uh, a, a four track dryer where the product spends most of the time at the, at the amp, ambient temperatures of maximum 90 degrees. And on the return track, this is the last track here above, we can do the final drying. So the product spends about 13% of its 
drying time in this hot section. And this is the dry efficiency section. Um, a duct was bolt on the building uh, with the fan and the heat exchanger uh, supplied from the dry efficiency heat pump. And here we can provide higher temperatures to do the residual drying. How does the installation look like? This is the absorption heat pump. Uh, it is hidden behind sheet metal here. Uh, and this is the dry efficiency heat pump in a container. Uh, inside we find piston compressors, eight piston compressors. The refrigerant is the mention from uh, developed by Chemours, the Labricant, the one from Fuchs Schmierstoffer, the other partner in the project. Yeah, below here you see this, this recirculation duct with the big heat exchanger. Yeah, this is the installation. And yeah, the goal of not the goal, our, our, our task in, in this project was the demonstration of the functionality and the reliability of this heat pump and how to integrate it. And uh, what do I think about heat pumps in a brick factory? I think it's the, the absolute best instrument to recover latent heat from our moist airflow, especially out of the dryers, but we can also think about flue gas condensation. The high temperature heat pump like dry fission, this makes sense when uh, there's an energy source available that is not too far away, um, not much colder than the temperature we need in the dryer. And this depends on the size of the building. Like in Uttendorf, we need temperatures above 90 degrees. Um, then dry efficiency can be uh, connected to an absorption heat pump system and makes a re really interesting uh, solution. And what we also have to think about other benefits when we do this wet air condensation is that we do water recovery. This is not important in Austria, but when we have, when you look to facilities in Italy and in Macedonia and wherever, uh, water is an issue. And we have to be aware that for one ton of fired product, we have to evaporate uh, more than 250 kilograms of water. And we talk about uh, around 300 tons per day of product. So this is a lot of water we could recover and it's uh, demineralized, so it's, it's, it's of high quality. Yeah, and then, then the second benefit for the operation of our convection dryers is that we reduce the air mass flow through the, through the dryer when we operate with internal heat exchangers. And what have we seen so far in Utendorf? We operated uh, from 120 degrees sink temperature up to 160. You can make a calculation to find out the COP, but this made Veronica on another slide here. <laughs> uh, with, here you see the temperatures uh, we operated on. Uh, the 160 degrees was the target. We, 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 we proved that, that it works well, but the energy consumption is quite high. And, and we pay much more for the electricity compared to Agrana. So most of the time we operated at 120 degrees sink temperature. And when we compare the CUP uh, to market available uh, machines, heat pumps, we see that the dry efficiency heat pump performs quite well and additionally provides higher uh, temperatures than market available ones. When we look on the, on the, on the uh, environmental impact, uh, we see that the benefit drops the higher the, the, uh, the, the sink temperatures are, the asked ones. But when you look on 120 degrees where we operated in, in Utendorf, uh, calculations show that we can reduce energy consumption and CO2 emission uh, about 80% compared to a gas-driven uh, drying process. And this charts, uh, the, the basis is that the energy source, the temperature so, uh, had uh, nearly 90 degrees. This was the absorption heat pump sink circuit and the emission factors for natural gas and electricity are the, from the, I think these are the European, the Austrian ones, the Austrian values, yes. And here be aware that in all the countries, I live in Austria, this installation is in Austria and the ones from European, average and other countries differ. So the environmental impact depends on the electricity mix you have and on the natural gas you're connected to. Yeah, thank you for your attention and feel free to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So as you said, indeed, let's 
you said feel free to ask questions. I see that already there's 10 questions in our Q&A. So I propose we first go through these. Um, so there's a first question. Can we expect subsidies for capital projects in heat pump transformation? In our experience, support for fuel conversions, fossil to biomass is a great help. I'm not sure who is the best person to answer this. Is anyone motivated to provide an answer to this question? I think um, I could quickly answer that. I think in most countries you have national incentives which actually can be used to, um, to get for financial support for this um, kind of technologies we are developing here. And um, I only can speak for Norway. We have a very nice um, state subsidy here for this, but uh, in other countries, surely as well, but it's really national wise in my experience. Okay. The same is true for Austria. There are also national incentives if you apply a heat pump in an industrial system. Okay. I would say uh, take a look on the on the uh, on the certificate prices for CO two emissions. They are uh, rising rapidly, and in, I think in in some industries it will be mandatory uh, to do something uh, even without subsidies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it becomes expensive. Yeah. yeah, I'm just wondering when we think about yeah the different subsidy schemes in the different countries. Is anyone aware? Is there somewhere an overview made of these subsidies in different member states? Does this exist already? No, that's maybe something for us EHPA to keep in mind um, to do to do that in the near future, so we could help uh, on questions like this. Um, yeah, the next question from the same person is also to Michael Bentle. What are the quality requirements for R718 in heat pumps, similar to boiler feed water or stricter? Yeah, I think uh, we used in our, uh, when we tested it in the lab, we simply used the tap water without any uh, restrictions or so. Um, I think for the dryer, we see that there are certain uh, particles and impurities in the, in the steam. So we have for safety reasons installed there also a filter, but we don't have any sort of strict regulations. We can use simple water, nothing special. <laughs> Great. Okay. <laughs> um, then let's go to the next question. So on the example from Mr. Dr. Wilke with the 160 degrees, what is the Qmax the application provides and what was the refrigerant? So, for video. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so the heating capacity of our demonstrator is about 400 kilowatts. So we have realized um, in, in the operation so far 350 kilowatt of heat supply. And the refrigerant is R1336MZZZ uh, or OptanMZ. Uh, we have decided for, uh, to use that synthetic refrigerant because it's suitable for uh, temperatures up to 160 as the critical temperature is um, I think it's 171. So we can operate the close to peat pump um, in the condensation mode. Um, so no transcritical operation and reach those high supply temperatures. And I will um, also answer the next question related to the close to peat pump and the refrigerant um, on butane. Uh, at EIT, we also looked into butane. Uh, we have done research projects on that. But for dry efficiency, we wanted to go to one up to 160, and therefore we decided to use um, Optanum set. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Um, then there's a question from someone who is writing a review paper on high temperature heat pump. And his question is, which parameter is more important? Compressor, natural refrigerant, integration, and many others. Secondly, which one is more efficient for industrial processes, compression system or absorption system? So, anyone? I, I, I would answer to the question, uh, compression or absorption. Uh, there is no answer. It's a question of, of, of energy available and, and, and price levels. Absorption systems do only make sense when there's a a source of energy available that you can use for something else. Yeah. Okay. 
in our case, in a brick factory, there's always this heat, this cooling zone of the kiln, and there's always some excess energy, and you can find uh, situations where it really makes sense to install an absorption heat pump. And then on the first part of the question, which parameter is more important, compressor, natural refrigerant integration, and many others? Hmm. Not sure. Yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> I think you always have to check heat source, heat sink uh, temperatures, uh, match it somehow to the working conditions of different working fluids, do a sort of screening there. And then also try to find the uh, available equipment on high TRL level. Um, and hopefully this uh, puzzle adds up to the picture. <laughs> so that is not an easy answer. There is a reason why you can write a review paper about that. <laughs> okay. Then, uh, I would, Veronica, maybe you agree or disagree. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And I think it's important to, to really start with the process and the needs of the process and, and develop everything from there because. Mm. Then you will get uh, the, the maybe certain boundaries, what's possible and what's useful. Okay. okay. Um, then let's go to another question. So this one has been answered. Then for uh, Mr. Laminger, which ref, ref, which refrigerant do you use in your application? Yeah, as already said, uh, using the Opteon MCs from Kemur as the same as uh, at Wienerberger. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then someone is curious how the COP of implemented heat pump changes with part load conditions. Is it a variable ski speed compressor heat pump and how flexible is it to adapt to varying load conditions? Anyone? I can start with that one. Maybe someone would like to add some details. So um, for the closed loop heat pump, we have variable speed compressors for both systems. And we will definitely also look into part loop conditions um, and to, to learn more about the behavior of the compressors and, and the system itself. Um, for the applications, it's not really necessary to adapt to variable load conditions because the heat pumps are much smaller than the industrial application. So we're basically feeding into a very big system that can take all the energy that we provide there. Uh, what's interesting to see is the influence of the source temperature that was already mentioned by, by Thomas. This is also a factor that really influences the operation and the efficiency of the heat pump. Mm. I think for the open loop, we have a quite narrow field of operation that comes from the characteristic of the turbo machinery, which uh, at the highest pressure level has a quite small uh, acceptable variance in mass flows. So that is um, then uh, really the answer here that part loads uh, is a problem. For the scanship demo side, we solved it that we have basically two dryers connected to one open loop heat pump system. And uh, otherwise, you basically just have to recirculate steam uh, without doing much work. And that's not uh, the ideal condition. So it should match quite nicely, I think, in the um, industrial side. Okay. Thank you. Then let's move to the next uh, question. We keep getting new questions. So uh, <laughs> public is very active. Um, so the next question is, in the dryer, the temperature is lifted in two stages. Stage one using absorption heat pumps and then using output from this heat pump in evaporator of another high temperature heat pump. However, is there any possibility to use a single heat pump to obtain high temperature lift, uh, such as from 30 to 120 uh, degrees? Does the former split system results in better system performance than a later single system? Yeah, um, there. I don't know if a lift from 30 to 100 degrees is possible. This is a question to Veronica. I think it's um, a big... I would, is a, yeah. I would not go for a single machine. Yeah, I think it's a it's big... system any, anyways. So it's, yeah. it's a compression system or an absorption system. It's another question, but it would be a cascade. Yeah, the absorption system is in our case uh, uh, a good solution because there's free energy available to, to operate the system to, as a driving energy. This is essential to when you think about uh, absorption. When there's no absorption, when there's no excess heat available, uh, for, I don't know, a, a double stage compression heat pump, I would think is, is the solution to be selected, yeah. 
Mm. Okay. Um, let's look at the next one. So regarding the brick factory, uh, what are the inputs of the existing system and the heat pump concept? Gas costs or euro per kilowatt hour, electricity costs, and what is the payback time? So we stay with you, uh, Stefan. Oh, the, the costs, well, uh, Winneberg is a multinational and there are very, really big price differences in all the countries. In Austria, you can think about slightly below 30 euro per megawatt hour of, of thermal, of natural gas, and I don't know, uh, between 60 and 80 megawatt, uh, euro per megawatt hour electricity. But there are big differences when you talk about Sweden or Croatia or France or Austria. <clears throat> so this is always a question you have to answer locally. So and then you can think about the payback time. This is not, I cannot give you a figure. This was in a demonstration project and the return on investment is, I don't know where. This was <laughs> demonstration and not, not uh, how to say, optimization of a plant. Okay. Yeah, but in general, I think this would be yeah very interesting for other yeah. companies that would like to apply the solution and that are still yeah, one of these barriers that was uh, was identified also by the commission is this reluctance of companies to enter into a new business that is not their core activity. So this type of numbers, payback time, and so on, I think would help to attract. We need, yeah. Yeah. Is this something that uh, the project is is looking at? If it's the benefits. We are also looking into the multiplication potential. We had a, we had a look at the different um, companies, different situations there. And we also try to estimate the, the number of heat pump units that would be possible in Europe um, based on statistic da statistics data for uh, waste heat and, and then the heat demand. So these are just um, rough estimations to, to really get the feeling. So in that study we calculated um, more than 8,000 units um, of high temperature heat pumps, um, which I think is, a, is an interesting potential to tackle. And, and for that study, we, we considered also the economic boundary conditions, not, not what, is, um, what scientists might dream of to be implemented in the future, but what would be actually uh, the, uh, an economic interesting solution. Okay, that's very good. That's, uh, also in the, what do you say, our advocacy work, this is a very valuable study. Okay, let's go to the next question. How high is the noise of the multi-stage heat pump? I don't. I've, I. I don't know. It's it's in the it's in the factory. Maybe you remember the picture. It was it's placed right next to the kiln, and on the other side there's the dryer, and there are many fans around. Uh, you not you do not notice that there's another um, noise generator placed in the factory. Uh, it's encapsulated in this container with with uh, with noise. How to say noise reducing panels? It's okay. Okay. No value available. Good to know that it's okay. <laughs> I can confirm. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, and then the next question: How many times can the heat pump stop and start daily without affecting the compressor efficiency so bad? I think we have mostly, we are aiming for continuous operation, right? That we are starting up once and then we, um, because the startup procedures and high temperature heat pumps are in general a little bit tricky maybe. So we want to start it up once and then have it in operation for as many hours as, uh, as possible. So um, of course, if the heat pump doesn't work, it doesn't reduce emissions. So that is just a, a very simple mathematics, but um, Ideally, we would aiming for 6,000, 8,000 operational hours maybe during a year. And then you don't shut it down during a, on a daily basis. So. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can confirm that as well. Um, and it also depends on the system temperature. If you think of a full shutdown, when everything cools down, then it takes quite a long time to heat everything to operation, which is again mm -hmm. shorter. So we also experience short interruptions. Um, this is, uh, it's not so much a problem of efficiency, but it's a problem of downtime and not providing benefit to the process. 
I think the open mm -hmm. loop takes around 45 minutes to maybe one hour to come from a very cold state up to the operational temperature where we want to have it. So this one hour is not efficient at all. <laughs> it's like in a COP of around one, it's direct heating. And uh, about above that, it's then uh, much better. So of course we, uh, we want to avoid total shutdown and uh, starting up again from our temperature. However, it also takes time to cool out the heat pump once you had it at the operational temperature, you can shut it down for 30, 40 minutes and it doesn't cool out. There's a certain thermal inertia in the, in the whole system. Okay. Um, then the next question is on the biomass dryer, how to remove the air from the steam stream entering the compressor? So I guess this is a question for Paul from the yeah. uh, We We have a thermodynamic steam or condensate trap uh, on uh, both the jacket of the dryer and the uh, heat exchangers. So uh, they will uh, re expel the excess air with the condensate uh, in a very easy fashion. So there are no problems with that at all. We face some, some oxygen during filling since it's a batch dryer, but this is depleted uh, quite uh, quickly. Uh, and not affecting the efficiency of the compressors uh, uh, significantly. Okay. Thank you. Um, then we have a next question, a more zoomed out question, I would say. What is, in your opinion, that stops wide deployment of such systems in the industry? Are the heat pump units hard to standardize? That's very interesting, I think. So who will feels would like to provide an answer? I think uh, energy prices. <laughs> um, we have uh, in a, on this white paper, we have this nice map of um, in which countries uh, you have very favorable energy prices compared to uh, which countries not. And of course, uh, a very high potential is uh, in general in Germany, Italy and France and so on. But it's also the countries where renewable energy is uh, three or four times as expensive as fossil fuels. And I think that is um, one of the main problems when it comes to this technology. Uh, Scandinavia, energy price difference of one. Their heat pump projects are much, much more beneficial, also economic. And that's, for example, the reason why we heat all our, our, our houses in Scandinavia, mostly by heat pumps. Yeah? It uh, doesn't make sense to use um, another technology from the mm -hmm. cost. I would say this is similar with, uh, how do you say, residential heat pumps. As you say, this is not only a problem for industry, but are there any, any other barriers that you could identify? Also, what I, I mentioned before, the, the barriers identified by um, the commission that you, do, you recognize. So, for example, this insufficient awareness and knowledge, reluctance of, of companies to enter into this, maybe regulatory and contractual frameworks um, that are lacking. And uh, maybe barriers related to planning, transaction costs, yeah, and pricing signals that we already mentioned. Any of the, these others that you can share your experience on? Yeah, for the for the knowledge transfer and also the raising of awareness, uh, we do webinars like this. So um, spread the word and, and and make it known. I think a lot has been done in the last years. And if we look back when we started the project, it was. Uh, like a very crazy idea to, to make that um, available for the first time. And also when we look now at the um, scientific community active in this field, it has grown. Uh, there are many publications available. There are new products coming up. So this is an dynamic field and, and we all actively address this, um, this awareness and, and knowledge barrier. Um, in the dry efficiency project, we also offer um, training courses on high temperature heat pumps. They will be launched in summer. So uh, this information will be made available on our website. Um, maybe it's already there. Um, I haven't checked, but um, courses will take place in, in July and August. And um, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, I kindly invite you to join us there. For the other part of the uh, sharing the benefits, I think this mostly relates to um, industrial parks or district heating projects whenever you have more than one stakeholder um, included. So in our cases, we have... Uh, it's the same company that has the waste heat and that has the benefit of the waste heat. And I think that's uh, certainly the easiest way to implement such a project because uh, then you can realize the benefit for yourself. Okay. 
I can mention some one thing that is not valid for Agrana, but for us, we have never had a situation that they are pressurized uh, water circuits in a brick plant. And with a high temperature heat pump, you have your first uh, uh, water duct system under pressure, and you have to do all this. Uh, 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 you have to fulfill all the rules that are for us new. But I think this is to overcome. It's also the same question of technological maturity. Uh, when we started the tri efficiency projects, we had uh, maybe a list of four or five possible suppliers and so on. This was six years ago, I guess. And now when we do uh, similar uh, investigations, the list is now up to 20 <laughs> uh, so possible suppliers in different temperature ranges. So I think really a lot of things has happened here. And uh, this technology, high temperature heat pump is up and coming. But of course, now we have reached 150 degrees. And the question is already coming, how can we reach 250 degrees? So we are always pushed to uh, extend the limit. But um, also up to 100 degrees, I think high temperature heat pumps, this was considered high temperature like five, six years ago. That's really uh, now a sort of standard solution. And now um, the technological readiness level has moved. And 150 degrees, I think, will be also on a higher maturity level after tri efficiency and uh, all our work here. And the demonstrate sites, they really show that it's actually possible to do this, right? And uh, everybody wants to be the second or third one who buys a high temperature heat pump, but the very first one is very tricky. <laughs> so this was a learning we had here. Okay, that's, I think that's actually quite a good conclusion. And we're also at the end of our time, but there's still a lot of questions. So I'm thinking maybe the panel can try to uh, type an answer to these questions. So if you open the Q&A, you can see the, the different questions. And if you have uh, some time, maybe you can look at that. And I would also maybe suggest that the people asking um, the questions can leave their uh, email addresses in the Q&A before leaving, so they can be uh, contacted directly by the panelists to follow up on these things. Um, I also see that there's things in the chat. Okay, yeah, we can also send from EHPA the different questions to um, the different panelists, um, so they can provide an answer uh, after the webinar. In any case, we will follow up on the questions and make sure that everyone uh, receives an answer. So uh, thank you very much. I think this was a very interesting uh, webinar also uh, for me and um, with very uh, interesting uh, uh, technical explanations. And it really shows that this project has, has, has a lot of added value and can really contribute to also the energy and climate targets of uh, the European Commission. So we will certainly use also the study that Veronica told us about and the different materials in our uh, advocacy work. Um, to try to make these solutions also more known among policymakers. And uh, then to close, um, yeah, I would like to thank uh, all the, the, the audience, but also, of course, uh, the speakers and the organizers and my colleagues at, at EHPA who organized um, this uh, webinar. And I would also like to invite you all uh, for the closing uh, final conference of the dry efficiency uh, project that takes place on the 6th of July. Uh, and you can see uh, the information here on the screen and you can also find it on the website of the dry efficiency project so thank you everyone and uh, have a nice day and see you soon at the next uh, dry efficiency event bye